Well, before we begin this morning in Revelation 15, have you noticed in your life that your attention span is getting shorter and shorter? Am I the only one? This is uh, Nightly News did a little survey here, and they've been noticing. It says the average attention span has decreased by four seconds since 2001. So every year, four seconds. I don't know if you can read this. It's a little blurry here. But average attention span in 2000 was 12 seconds. Average attention span in 2013 was eight. This is nightly news. This one over here was Microsoft study. Uh, 43% of people abandon lengthy emails in the first 30 seconds. You ever do that? Facebook, long post, just go right by it, right? Can't even read it. We don't even have the attention span to read it. 32.2, tune out long-winded coworkers after 15 seconds. Charlie Brown's teacher, right? They're talking to you, but you're not hearing a word they say. Our attention spans are shrinking. So I'm challenging myself. Get to the point, make it good, and get out. All right? We're told not to be long-winded, right? So my challenge to myself is to get these sermons done in 30 minutes or less and make a solid, good point so that I don't lose you. Too much manna does what? What does it do over time? It rots, it rots right? So let's get started. Revelation chapter 15. Last time, in brief review, we looked at verse 1. It talked about the fact that the seven angels had the seven last plagues. We looked at the timing. We looked at this schematic here that showed us the timing. The three angels' messages would swell to a loud cry just before probation closed. We spent significant time talking about the fact that there are phases of those three angels' messages. In other words, the Millerite movement gave the first angel's message, but did they give it in its fulfillment or its entirety? No, because when they were announcing the day of God's judgment has come, it had not come, right? And so more significance is placed on the first angel's message now, we could say, than it was then. We are preaching it in its fulfillment, in its in entirety. The same principle goes for the second and third angel's message. We need to get those messages out there. But how much more significant, how much fuller will they be when church and state has combined? When the Sunday law is in force, when the mark of the beast is a reality, it's real time. That's why the second and third angels join with the first and they swell to the loud cry. The latter rain brings clarity to that. God's people unify, as we talked about in Sabbath school, and God desperately wants to reach every man, woman, and child in this world so that he can come for his people. Amen? Amen? Now with that, the devil is angry, and we said that God's people will face great deceptions, and when those don't work, he will answer with great persecution. And that's why during this time, God's people will face great persecution leading up to that probation close, which is fitting that Revelation 15, 2 would encourage us with these words. John, looking into the future now, passed, passed the seven last plagues to a group of people who stand with God. It says, And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. Oh, I want to be among that group, don't you? Now, this sea of glass should take us back to the sanctuary model. You remember the tabernacle that Moses set up there in the desert that he was instructed to build according to that pattern that he saw in heaven, right? Later, Solomon sort of magnified that pattern, made it bigger and grand. We see here in 1 Kings 7 and verse 23 as he's building this laver for washing. What is it called? He made the sea of cast bronze. Ten cubits from one brim to the other. It was completely round. Its height was five cubits. Its line of 30 cubits measured its circumference. Very large edifice called here the sea. This is the same symbolism that we find in the book of Revelation. Now, in Solomon's time, if you would have had a higher vantage point, if you could have looked down upon the scene, that laver for washing would have looked like a sea, if you will, of glass on the surface. Now, the first time we're intro introduced to it in reality, John sees it in vision in chapter 4. He's called up to the very throne room of God, and it says, before the throne, there was a sea of what? Of glass, like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. 
Our text this morning adds one more element. Not just a sea of glass, but it says a sea of glass mingled with fire. Now what is our God if he's not a consuming fire? Telling us that this is in the very presence of God. Also, fire purges. Fire cleanses. And so the element of fire here brings to light the fact that God's people who will stand here in this scene must go through a great time of cleansing or persecution. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18, is this not the counsel given by the true witness? He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the what? Fire. In the fire that you may be rich. We're told that that gold is our character. Our characters must be refined in the fire, that fire of tribulation, that fire of testing and trial. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, tells us that there is a fruit from this testing time. Paul says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. James chapter 1 tells us, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking how much? Nothing. There are two groups when Jesus comes back. Those who have survived this process and those who haven't. Our God is a consuming fire. If He were to come in all His glory as we sit here today, would we survive? No way. The character much, must be cleansed. In Revelation, those who are in the wicked camp, those who have chosen the side of disobedience, cry out for the rocks to fall on them. And they ask this great question. They said, for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand, almost insinuating, nobody can stand in the presence of this great God. But yet we know there will be a group who stands. Amen? Isaiah 33 and verse 14 gives us clues into that question. Same question is asked, who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings, with the very presence of God himself? And the answer is given. He who walks how? Righteous. Righteously and speaks uprightly. He who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing of evil. He will dwell on high his place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him. His water will be sure. Just like those three Hebrew men who stood with Jesus in that fire, but yet were not consumed. They were righteous in his sight and therefore were not consumed by that fire. I want to stand like that, don't you, someday? Now, as I said before, during this loud cry experience, which we want to be on the forefront of God's work, the devil will not be happy. And he will throw everything that he has at these people in the last days. We're told in Luke chapter 21, Jesus tells us, But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you, persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. 21 verses 16 through 17, You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated by just a few people for my name's sake. Is that what it says? Hated by how many? Hated by all. Friends and family will betray us. Country and king will condemn us. You will feel as if you are standing by yourself. Mount of Blessing, page 31. Through trials and persecution, the glory or the character of God is revealed in his chosen ones. The church of God, hated and persecuted by the world, are educated and disciplined in the school of Christ. They walk in narrow paths on earth. They are purified in the furnace of affliction. They follow Christ through sore conflicts. They endure self-denial and experience bitter disappointments, but their painful experience teaches them the guilt and woe of sin, and they look upon it with abhorrence. Being partakers of Christ's sufferings, they are destined to be partakers of His glory. In holy vision, the prophet saw the triumph of the people of God. And you know what is quoted next? Revelation 15 and verse 2. 
You see, it's a promise. It's something that you and I should cling to as we go through the trials here on earth. How many here memorize the promises of God just for this occasion? Please put it into practice. We must cling to the Word of God. It is our hope. Amen? When God promises something, will He deliver? You better believe it. This is the promise that there will be a people that will stand who get the victory over the beast, his mark, and his number. They will stand in God's presence having the harps of God. They will worship, recognizing that He has done it all, and they have merely depended on Him with all that they have. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2-4 through 4 tells us the importance of God's promises. It says, Through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these, through these promises, you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. How many here want to escape that corruption? Amen. Amen. We need these promises. We need to cling to them as we do our very souls. Prophets and Kings, page 722. In the darkest days of her long conflict with evil, the church of God has been given revelations of the eternal purpose of Jehovah. His people have been permitted to look beyond the trials of the present to the triumphs of the future. When the warfare having been accomplished, the redeemed will enter the possession of the promised land. These visions of future glory, scenes pictured by the hands of God, should be dear to His church today. When the controversy of the ages is rapidly closing and the promised blessings are soon to be realized in all their fullness. One day, from a better place, you and I will be able to declare, heaven is cheap enough. Amen? No matter what we will have to go through, we will look back and we will say, heaven is cheap enough. I would do it a hundred times a thousand times to be here in this place. Think about it, friends. Joseph, betrayed by his own family, sold into slavery, wrongfully accused even when he stood for God's principles and said, how can I do this wicked thing and sin against my God? Again, thrown into prison. Some commentators say seven years. Some say up to 14 or 21. We don't know but thrown into prison for a very long time. And through all this, did Joseph lose heart? Did Joseph condemn God or blame God or turn from God in any way? None that we can find in Scripture. Rather than that, he looked to the promises. Remember, he had dreams. He looked to those dreams and said, God has given me these dreams. I know they mean something. I look for their fulfillment. And it kept him through even the darkest times. He looked through the darkness he clung to the promises of God, and God blessed him. And friends, if we had time, if we only had time this morning, because I know I've lost you, so all, some of you already, right? Twelve seconds was, was done a long time ago. But if only I had time, what more should I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to, fight the, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection." Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses that I just mentioned, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider Him who endured such hostility from sinners against Himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not resisted 
to bloodshed, striving against sin. We're going through some stuff right now. I know that you are too. There's challenges. There are things pressing in. The enemy's not happy. But let us consider him. Amen? Who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. The enemy wants you and I to throw in the towel. He wants you to be so discouraged that you say, I can't do it, I'm done. I can't fight this fight anymore. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, we have no other choice than to fight this fight, amen? amen? Like Peter, when Jesus said, will you leave also? What did Peter say? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. To turn back now, we have to deny everything that we know to be true. We have to turn our backs on the one who paid the ultimate price for you and I, and I will not do it by God's grace. I pray that you will not either. We must go forward. Amen? Let us remember the promise. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. I want to be among that crowd. I know you do too. You know, Horatio Spafford, he wrote that hymn that was the special music this morning. You probably have heard his story, but it's worth mentioning this morning. This hymn was written after a series of traumatic events in his life. The first was the death of his son at the age of four to scarlet fever. Immediately after that, the great Chicago fire of 1871 ruined him financially, wiped him out. Immediately following that, he sends his family ahead to Europe, those who were left while delayed on a business trip. He sent them ahead. The ship that his wife and four daughters were on collided with another ship, and he lost all four of his daughters in that tragedy. Then he received probably one of the most devastating messages that you could receive. A telegram comes from his wife, saved alone. Alone. As he traveled then by boat to his grieving wife, he penned the words of that great hymn. When peace, like a river, attendeth my soul, or my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to know it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross, I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh, my soul, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend a song in the night. O oh, my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. Horatio saw through the darkness. By faith he clung to the promises of God, and he had hope. We have hope, brothers and sisters. There is nothing that can separate you and I from the love of God. Amen? Let us never forget it. May we be standing when He comes again on those great clouds of glory. Let's remember that promise. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire and those who had the victory over the beast, over His image, over His mark, and the number of His name, standing on the sea of glass having harps. <laughs>